thanks for doing that. So now we say we're in the state of mind to actually study these things. Who was the boss of quizzes and homeworks? So who was here last week? Ha. So you're the bosses to help everyone else discuss quiz three, which is in one side of you. Yeah. And if you have your homeworks, you pass them to Emily. Yeah. And I'm also giving you the homework for tonight. Please take it. And if you're clever, I realize this halfway through studying these courses, that if I got the homework printed before class, then as I'm listening to class, I can just answer them, because I was always busy. And then that's how I did my homework. <laughs> so maybe if you, <laughs> if you get your homework done in class, you don't stress about not doing it later. So you've got you know, 15, 20 minutes to see if you can answer the quiz from last class, class three, which is, I think, the pink sheets quiz. Is that right? Yeah, great. Right. So if you've been here, please gather around the people that weren't here and help them and discuss and share what we learned, and then I'll summarize it. It's nice to see you back. I miss you too. <laughs> and if you, if you are short, it doesn't matter, write, write all your names on the one sheet. That's what we did last week. So, so three of you to one sheet, just write all your names. I'll take all the answers from from one sheet. It does look like a spider, I know. <laughs> you know what? It looks like a spider. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, cool, thank you. Yeah, that's a nice group there. And I know Jenna's not here, so you're not going to do anything. Oh, wait, what are we going to place? Okay, I can't help you ignoring yours. Have single-pointed concentration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, single-pointed concentration. I just make fun of you. I said, that's a nice group over there. And I said, since Jen is not here, I know you're not going to have the surface from last week. <laughs> Are you drinking it? That's too hot for you. No, I have the one right. 
But don't read the Tibetan text, just the English. Text, that is a, a poem, 
No, that, I mean, unless you want to take the answers as I'm giving it in class today, because <laughs> this is class one. It's just the two lines a second one? Yeah, so if you read them together. The excellent yeah. Is that correct? Right? Right? Yeah. Dharma Samhiti Sutra. Very good. Yeah. Oh, to attempt I didn't teach you that last week. Yeah. 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 yeah, but it's my beard. But we did talk about it. Yeah? Yeah. What it means is that all, everyone is the field of the Buddhists. Like potentially they're sitting there in every interaction. If everything is empty of being this way, that's the fact of seeing everybody as an enlightened being. But it comes from a sutra. From a what teaching? That's another teaching, yeah, <laughs> but from this, the Open Sutra, this is a scriptural reference. Cool. But yes. And the quote says, the field of living beings is the field of the Buddhas. And it's from this field of the Buddhas that you have to find the opposite of their Field of living Buddha's things. In the field of the Buddha. Woods. I really like me. Nice. Animals yeah, love me. Two minutes? One minute? No. One minute? Go. That we reach the time. You won. Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> What is she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? It's like. To do the opposite is very wrong. Where is she? Where is your mom? Wait, did you just tell Daphne that she wanted to make sure it's Alistair? Because they've got the Christmas friends. Yeah. 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 No cheating. As long as you go through the process in your head, that's you're gonna. That's the only way you're gonna get another layer of understanding. So let's try to start, shall we? Quizzes to Emily, please. Emily has kindly offered to. Look, I know we live in a very busy world, yeah, and you're probably not going to think about these things outside this class in the way that we're thinking about it here. So to spend the time doing this actually really helps take root in your mind. Here, Emily, I bought you a present, which is gold stamps for the people that get really good. <laughs> then that all is not marked, or some are marked, but if you can submit them. Yeah? And then these are from this class, which I have not yet. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know why I didn't think about it earlier. Yeah, because I tried all these other techniques to get us to do more than just talk about Dharma. And I'm listening to you all teach each other and share experiences. And I think more of the class should be that way. It's really beautiful because that's the only way you're going to internalize it. It's really, really beautiful. Like I sit here going, oh, it's stunning. Okay, so this <laughs> last three classes summarizes the chapter on patience in the Bodhisattva Charavata, which is the book we're studying from 700 AD. 1300 years ago, 
people were thinking on the psychological techniques to break free from suffering, then this text is the most stunning. <laughs> he did lick it. I know, but it, it was it. cold. That was I more know, of the yeah. and, <laughs> and we get the fortune to study these in detail for us. We spent three nights reading the chapter on patience and understanding the commentaries that explain the code inside these words. And you have a vast understanding already, but we spent three nights. They spent about a year and a half in the monastery on this chapter of patience. So we, we've got this cursory Western understanding. And because we're Western, we think we know it all, right? We're like, oh yeah, we got it. We understand this. We just reframe it into our own experience and we think we've got it. But there is depth to this content. Like you can see thinking about it and trying to live it. But having done that, the, studied the art of not getting angry when you're supposed to, um, I just want to highlight some practical things that I think we take away from those three nights and made a list for you. The, the number one thing that I think you should always remember about that chapter is that anger, not the anger, patience is not getting angry. Patience doesn't mean just hang around waiting for a bus. Patience in this reference means the art of not getting angry, not allowing anger to arise because it is so disgustingly destructive to your happiness, to your world, to every goodness you could ever experience. And he gave a whole bunch of examples of why anger does that in the moment. So saying the stupid thing to your partner or the stupid thing to your boss or the stupid thing to your family can destroy years of beautiful relationships. So just in one life, let alone the unseen effects of anger, not having patience, which according to Master Shantideva and other scriptures, it destroyed vast amounts of virtue, the energy, the, the karma, the, the stuff producing the goodness in the first place. So if you imagine a collection of energy in your consciousness, in your being, generating the marvelousness of this experience, anger, not having patience, erodes that and makes things turn bad. Yeah, and erodes tons of that. So Master Shantideva started really strong and said, there is no reason for anger. And then he gave a bunch of logic why anger by itself doesn't serve whatever you got angry about. Getting angry about not getting something or getting angry about someone getting something you didn't think they should have doesn't change those those things. It doesn't give you the thing you wanted to get. I got angry and then all of a sudden your problem is solved. You still have the problem and then you have anger. It's completely stupid but when you think about it, but we don't think about it. We're so used to abrupt, erupting and if, if you're not a person that shows your anger outwardly because you've become an uh, Eastern meditator, yogi, Buddhist, I bet you you have it inside, right? And that's dangerous. That's dangerous if you don't address it. So the first thing I want to say is, Master Shantideva said, anger, seek and destroy. No, no reason to have it because it will destroy you. It's your cancer, yeah? And patience means not getting angry. Then he, I think he went into the three arguments at the time of where does all the stuff that you think gets you angry come from? And I think that's another fundamental part of the three chapters. You have to identify your most subtle, subtle, subtle understanding of where your world comes from. Because without that, you can't stop anger. You can't stop patients correctly. If you think anything that you're experiencing comes from out there onto you forcing that reaction, then you will never be able to get out of that cycle because it's not up to you. It's up to either a bearded guy in the sky that decides when you're good and bad, and then you're just in a bad boat for a little while and sometimes you're in a good boat, or it's about stardust that just happened to turn crappy today and then tomorrow is crap, not crappy and you really can't find causation. 
right? So he went through a whole, oh, there's no rhyme or reason at all. It's just is what it is. And then you have to put up with it, which means you don't know when the next thing that gets you angry is coming along. Or it could be that the habitual pattern in your consciousness is producing your response to the stimuli of this reality. And understanding that and addressing that to whatever capacity or wherever you've entered this matrix allows you the freedom to manipulate it and dial it up or down, hopefully down to anger, up to joy, and then you truly have the power to transform your world. So I think that's the second most important thing that he covered in this chapter. Really identify where you think the angry boss came from, the the shitty relationship came from, the lack of money came from, the depression came from, the falling out hair came from, etc. The things that get you angry. Now, he also gave us the most stunning advice, which was there's more than there's so many reasons not to get angry. But remember the two the two paragraphs that said if there's something you can do about it, there's no use in get no point in worrying about it, and therefore getting angry. If there's nothing you can do about it, there's no use in worrying about it. So getting angry, frustrated about whatever it is you're trying to do doesn't help what you're trying to do. So that was I think the other most important thing. Then he said, like you know, like all good Buddhist logic, they when they recognize a problem, they believe so fundamentally in ultimate causation that they're going to look at what are the causes for a person getting angry. If it doesn't come from out there and doesn't come from out there, what are the real causes? And so they say, well, well there are conditions that produce anger in the nominal world for us, and they are irritation, frustration, getting upset, right? Upsetness. So he's saying, starve it of upsetness. Do not allow your mind to even get a tiny bit upset because that's what anger feeds off and grows into an explosive reaction you will do great. So then I think that's the other important thing from the first three chapters. But the first three classes, the chapter on patience is recognize that any time you get upset, you're putting out food for anger to come and feed off. And it, it, it won't bite your hand the first few times because now it knows you've got its name. And so it, it's going to come and eat and go away and come and eat and go away until you get irritated a little bit, irritated a little bit. And over a period of time, it actually eats you up. Yeah, it gets strong enough to eat you up. Um, and that, I think the other thing that came out of the class, I think it was Rachel's question. We ended up talking about karma, even though it's not the cause here. We talked about, you know, if everything is caused, then, you know, I, do I have the karma to have choice? Mm -hmm. And then we ended up talking about how seemingly impossible it is to get out of a downward cycle, a, a downward spiral. You know, once you're headed to a downward spiral, it seems almost impossible. Where is my free will? if? If karma determines whether or not I can see a goodness or act with patience or make some efforts, if karma is the determinant of that, then I'm screwed, basically, you're saying self-existent karma. You know, we're like, we're screwed. And that then led us to the, a really important point, which is we do have, you do experience the capacity to make choice. You can say something now, you can choose not to. I can choose different words than the words I'm choosing. I have that capacity, I have the karma to experience that and act within that bandwidth and that range. Remember that discussion? Yeah. So then it's about getting that bandwidth, that karma growing as well. And you can turn, whenever you see an opportunity to do a goodness, whenever you see an opportunity to do a virtue, whenever you see an opportunity to not get angry, get irritated or help another person not get angry, you jump on that opportunity because that's when the door opened up. And then you're living a completely rich, internal, secret life in a world that seems normal out there, but you're generating the causes for complete happiness and the erosion of the biggest thing that can destroy your virtue, which is not having patience. Yeah. So I think that was another big, big, important thing of that chapter. And then... Um, then he gave a whole bunch of reasons of why there's just no point at all in getting angry when sticks and stones, remember? When people say words to you, were all these things in your test or not? 
Yeah. No. Okay. They're on the homework. Okay. Oh, true. Mm-hmm. Whenever people say words to you, there's no word I can say to you right now that will force anger from you. But if I start saying words at you, I bet you some of you will get angry. Yeah. I'll say some words and see if you get angry. No. Andate un poco la ritmo. That's the Spanish words. They don't do anything unless you understand Spanish. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that, that he gave the argument that really if you had control over your mind, people can say anything. If they're over there and I'm over here and I throw words at you, can these words produce anger from you? Or is it your engagement with these words and your conceptualizing of these words? and your Because that part you have complete control of, right? You have control. And if not immediate control, you've got capacity to habituate a control. So he says, sticks and stones. And then he says, well, what if, you know, we're all good Buddhists and whatever, but what if someone comes and destroys the shrine or burns the books or destroys the images? Because you should, shouldn't you get angry then? You know, and that this is one of the most beautiful things. You know, there's all these hooks along the path that give you certainty to say, oh, I'm, I'm on the right path for me. And for me, this was one of them. To have a religious practice or a philosophical practice, to have Buddhists say, you know, even if they burn this stuff, I still hold view and I still have Dharma and I still have knowledge and I still have peace. It, you can burn everything around me. Up. I might not like it, but I will not get upset. I will not let it destroy my virtue. Yeah, and that's stunning for me to have something like that, because it doesn't become dogmatic in that sense. So then, do you remember the the arguments that they had about why if someone burnt the statue, for example, or the books, what what his argument was why you shouldn't be angry? Do you remember that? You can't. Something that's yeah, so if the Buddha is enlightened, right? It, a, is the Buddha inside that statue, like sitting there waiting no. for you to talk to it, mm-hmm. right? No, and, he, and if he was, right? It, a, he doesn't reside there. Um, and B, if he did, you can't hurt it, you can't burn it if it's in a state of perfection, if it's in a state of bliss, if it's an enlightened entity. They cannot experience any suffering at all, regardless of what you do to them. They will only experience it as bliss. Yeah. So they can't hurt the Buddhas anyway. And then they say, well, what about the teachers? What if they say bad things about my teachers or they try and harm my teachers? My gurus, who you're supposed to see as an enlightened being, as a practice to generate that virtue in your mind. He gave two arguments. And I think that's another important thing because it really puts all the responsibility back on your experience of the world, right? One was, if they are truly your teacher and you're really seeing them as enlightened beings, nothing can harm them, right? And it's obviously a teaching for you to to go through the process and understand where that causation was for you. But if they weren't, if you see them not as a Buddha, if you see your teacher as a um, person, then their karma. It's absolutely their karma. And you, you can't change it even if you wanted to. Right? And then the last thing is, he talked about annoying people. Being unhappy when someone says a good thing about your enemy. Do you remember that one? Mm-hmm. So they come, someone at work comes and praises the person you hate the most. And says, oh, did you hear about, what's her name? She's so good with this. And you're like, ugh, they obviously don't know her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I know her because I know her to be evil and terrible. And the reality is that you're not doing yourself any favor by being unhappy that somebody is happy or has a good quality, right? So that feeds off, that feeds anger. So to address that as well, do not be unhappy when someone finds good in another person, regardless of how you view them, yeah? That even you love being praised, so why wouldn't you like someone else being praised? Do, do you remember that? Yeah, and I thought that was brilliant. And then encountering a, annoying people, like the person that most irritates you in a special way that nobody else does. And then um, he finished off the chapter with that. And then um, what, why are those people important? He says they are rare. Remember, they are so rare, like a gem yeah. box in your house or something. Yeah, like a chest of gems in your house. 
And I said, not for me. They annoying people appear all the time. Not so rare. <laughs> but what did he mean by that? The more you do it, the better you get at it, the less annoying people. Yeah, so the, the more you address your capacity for patience, the more you act on all this advice he gave you, you will find less and less irritating people in your life. You will find less and less moments when things trigger off that frustration. And you will forget you have it. And so to meet that one disgusting, terrible person that brings up the vomitous negativity in you, if you're well trained, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad you came. Because I didn't know I had this terrible thing. I'd forgotten. Now I can work on it. So then you become partners for your enlightenment. They provide the annoyingness and you provide the patience. And then together you get rid of that thing that came up. And there is no greater teacher than that at the time. And that builds up. You've got to build up to that. You can't go instantly and hang around all your annoying people because if you're always triggered to anger that's habituating the wrong thing. You grow slowly. All throughout the Bodhisattva Charavatara they give advice to say start small. Start with vegetables in the chapter of giving for example and end up by giving your arm or your eyeball. Right? But they say start small. And then they talked about the Sutra that describe how you view all, all sentient life, all sentient beings, and that you should look at them as the field of the Buddhas, because in essence they are that. In essence they are your capacity to get enlightened. Every interact, you can't do it on your own. You know, there's, you, you just can't do it on your own, you need other people. What if your irritation is with yourself? Yeah, you can't get away from that one. <clears throat> because that's, it's easy to go, oh, thank you so much, you, aunt, you, you, yeah. you irritating person. Yeah, okay, I can go like, yeah. yeah, sure, all of you are Buddhas, and I'm not going to get mad at you, but I'm a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. you are. You, I agree with you. Yeah? So yeah, thank <laughs> you. No, 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 no. <laughs> you just need a moment. Yeah. I agree. I think you're right, Nick. You're just the most annoying person. No. That we, we have that tendency so much in the West to self, uh, not flatulate, self. Well, that's that word. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what you're trying to say. Is it? Yeah. I thought it meant farting. Flatulating. So, I have that capacity too. Yeah. <laughs> but no, you understand what I mean. We, we have this <laughs> so flatulating. <laughs> no, I know. It does. <laughs> This is it. Remember also in the in the practice of patience, he talked about anger being a barometer for our ignorance. Yeah, and that doesn't mean more fuel for I'm an idiot. You know, it doesn't mean that. Ignorance means something very specific in the Buddhist scripture. It means we do not know what reality is. And because we do not know what reality is, we act towards our illusion of reality, the fakeness of our reality, as if it was the real thing. And in doing that, we make the mistake of having a world that is broken. So whenever you get angry, whenever you get agitated, whenever it's just a barometer, however often it is, regardless of the object, whether it's with your mind, with your body, with yourself, with your neighbor, with the world, with the situation, with time, with whatever, it's just a barometer of your ignorance. And I don't mean it as in, I mean, it's like a beautiful barometer because you get to see where you need to work at. And maybe you don't have the barometer going off when you're dealing with another person, but you have it going off when you're dealing with your conception of Nick. And so the only antidote to that is, to ignorance is wisdom, correct view. To look at truly, having intellectually ex understood and studied truly where the world comes from and this, you know, dependent origination for all the schools of Buddhism, you know, their parts, their causes and conditions and perception being dependent arising. You say there is no Nick like the one I think is self-existently negative and bad and that one can't exist that way. Nick is changing. What is Nick? Where is Nick? Find Nick. Find that annoying Nick. Oh, there it is. I pinned it down. You're not that. You're not that because you're talking about it from the third person, number one. 
But you can't be that because you're not like that all the time. Yeah? So that could be an instance and, and a, a being, a part of what goes through the being that is Nick. But if you get layer and layer and layer and layer down, what is Nick? What is this thing that I now call Nick? Getting to that identification of self, of who I am, of the ultimate self, yeah, you'll find no self. That wisdom smashes any thing that would say, I'll get annoyed at that one. Because that one doesn't exist in the way that you think it exists. That's what you're getting annoyed at. You want it to you want to hold an identity to a Nick. And because it's not fitting to that identity, you're annoyed. The mistake is, it was never that identity to, to start with. And if it wasn't, then there's nothing to be annoyed. You can actually see it for what it is. An instance that was caused by a previous moment of whatever, some cause. And you can be glad that that cause just finished. And then you turn an annoying situation into an opportunity for practice. Because you saw wisdom. And you either finish that karma, and this keeps coming back, and then you every time you're finishing that karma. Do you see what I mean? So you're just another object. It's just another object of the mind. Mm -hmm. So anytime you feel aggravated, there's zero excuse to yourself, to you, <laughs> like, no reason to be angry and frustrated. It erodes your goodness. And your goodness is what will jet fuel you out of orbit of samsara. It, and you need that fuel to be jam-packed with super fuel to go against the gravity which is this negativity we live in in samsara. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks for the question. So the, the way we do these classes is we read the parts of the chapter from, we're entering the chapter on the fourth perfection which is Joyful yeah, and joyful effort was Geshe Michael's translation. It's actually effort, yeah? And so I want to ask you before we go into it, because this threw me for, I'd say, five years. Even though I learned, like you might have heard it before or you're going to hear it again tonight, even though I learned what this is meant to mean, the word effort is charged for us. So if you didn't have to think about it and there was no right or wrong answer, and I said to you, what is effort? What's the first thing that comes to mind? What's effort? Work. Work. What's effort? Trying really hard. Hmm? Trying really hard. Trying really hard. What's effort? Anything. Taking action. an action. Taking an action. an action. Taking an action. Yeah. What was yours? Struggle. Sometimes. Struggle. Yeah. Energy. Right? Energy. Effort. Effort. Come on. Effort. Suffering. Force. Suffering. Yeah. Force. Yeah. See how it, the association to this word for us is mostly on what a pain in the ass activity to have to perfect, right? I have to now be really good at suffering, putting things by force. What was yours? Struggling. 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 Like, it's such a lovely perfection. I'm depressed already. Right? Like, just listening to you guys. I'm like, I don't want to do it now. But that's not what the translation means. So Geshe Michael said that his preferred translation is a joyful effort. And we'll hear in the reading why it is that, what the word is meant to be. And like all of the perfections, all of these six things that we're getting better and better at perfecting, which are the six things in this book, joyful effort is an important one, and you'll hear it in a second. They're all mental attitudes. They're all attitudes you form and expand and generate until you see the world through them. So it can't just be work. It can't just be struggle. It can't just be doing more and more and more and more. Because that's just an activity. They're referring here to an attitude that you color your mind with when you're doing stuff. Yeah? So it's important. To, if you can get that, you will, I'll save you five years and I'll take the karma for it. Right? Seriously, it threw me because those associations with the word effort are... I'm supposed to do this, and I'll have to do this, and then, bleh. and that is the opposite of what he means by joyful effort. So, um, Paul is going to read the first contemplation and the second contemplation, and this was written 700 AD in a place called Nalanda University in India, 
1,500 monks, monastics sitting in a room. Close your eyes and imagine yourself there. 1,500 plus people from all over Southeast Asia turning up to this place, like the most prominent university at the time, trying to understand the nature of man, nature of your mind. It's stunning. It's like philosophers from everywhere in the world. Convention on get your world to bliss. So join them, go back in time, and let's hear what Master Shantideva was saying. What's your practice patience? Begin your practice of effort. For enlightenment lies in making these kinds of effort. Without a breeze, they never flicker. And just so, in the absence of effort, merit can never occur. What is effort? It is joy in doing good. Great, thanks. Okay. So it starts off with once you once you've got patience down, right? Once you begin the practice of not getting angry, we're jumping onto effort. And he said in the second verse, what is effort? Joy and he said good. it is joy in doing good. I'll get to that in a second. The other, the first thing I want to get to is a, where does effort fit into the six perfections? Yeah? And why is it there? And what does he mean by this phrase, without a breeze they never flicker? That one sentence is loaded, loaded and charged with meaning as explained in the commentary and as you will experience as you put this into practice. Okay? So I want to talk about that first. So first of all, let, let's give me give me the six perfections. The first perfection, the first attitude that you build is the perfection of generosity. Generosity is the translation, but we prefer giving because there's three types of giving or three types of that mental attitude. The first one is giving material things. The second one is giving protection from harm. The third one is giving dharma, realizations to people, right? And so it's weird to say, oh, you're so generous with your realizations to me. You see, it's like generosity. Oh, he has generosity. He stops people from being hurt. You know, it's a weird translation to say generosity. Whereas giving encompasses more of the attitude you're building in your mind for those three. Number so, three is dharma? Yeah, giving the dharma. Yeah, giving dharma, meaning meaning really giving people moments of realization along their path. Yeah. The second perfection. So you have giving ethics. Ethics. Oh. We're doing the six perfections. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Ethics. So these are the six things that are covered in this book, and we've covered. Mm -hmm. Four. Page first. One to four. Hmm. We've covered. Mm, no, we, the, we didn't. Yeah, we didn't do giving yet. We never talked uh, about it. Yeah, that's right. We didn't, right? Yeah. Because yeah. that's, yeah, that's, that's the last chapter. So, giving. So you you think about giving. We haven't covered that yet. The second one is ethics, right? All the things that when you study the Vinaya are the boundaries for ethical behavior and tying ethics. To the practice through understanding karma and emptiness is really the key why ethics is such a vital part of getting you enlightened. It's not because you should be good because someone said so. Mistake, right? It's because once you understand where the world comes from, that the world is nothing but a mirror of every action you've ever done because there is no nature in existence in the way you think it exists out there separate from you then everything you're experienced is forced upon you by your past deeds. And if your past deeds are not ethical, you will experience things not ethical. You, the only way you experience harm is because you've done harm. The only reason you experience goodness is because you have goodness. To witness and experience this thing that doesn't have that nature from its own self. So that's the study of karma and emptiness, right? What's so the, number four? Number four of what? Physical things, protection from harm, giving dharma. That's it, there's just three. That's, That's all in number one. They're all in number one, sorry. So we're on one, right? We're all six perfections. Giving, ethics, not getting angry, not getting angry or patience, 
The fourth perfection is joyful, joyful effort. The fifth perfection is concentration. concentration or meditation. And the sixth perfection is wisdom. wisdom right? These six things will produce your enlightenment. These six things, if perfected, if, if the attitudes flower in your mind, if you put the courses in your mind, they will produce these two things. The Buddha body, the body of yourself as an enlightened being, i.e. your physical form, and your mind, the mind of an enlightened being, if these things are perfected. And they say that the first three of the perfections, the perfect, perfecting the attitude of giving, perfecting your ethical behavior in your world, perfecting patience, generate the <coughs> physical body, the Sambhogakaya, and the Nirmanakaya, the emanation body of a Buddha. For those of you who have studied that. They, it's called the collection of merit, because they are activities. They produce a physical thing. In the middle lies effort, the thing, the wind that flickers the flame. So the effort, the wind that flickers the flame, is generating the merit which produces the body of yourself to see yourself not as a dying creature but as an enlightened being with a form that doesn't look like this because there is no nature to this form the way you think it exists if there isn't any nature you're forced to experience this through the causes and conditions that brought you here but if it isn't in this thing then you can manipulate the experience that is forcing you to see this thing as that thing and by the collection of merit, the first three perfections, you can generate this to be a completely different body, the light body of an enlightened being. So that's the collection of merit, the first three of the perfections. Without wind, without effort, that can't flicker. Yeah? And then secondly, the last two perfections, the perfection of your mind, the capacity to concentrate, built through meditation, and the capacity for wisdom, perfecting wisdom, the last two perfections also can't flicker without effort. Without wind, they never flicker. So it's a profound statement that he says in one line on the opening lines of this chapter, telling you that the central place of effort in between the first three perfections and uh, before the last two perfections is actually the thing the thing that creates the two merits, yeah? Because without wind, they never flicker. And also, if you get to practice the secret teachings of Buddhism, there's actually code in there that is quite profound about if there is no wind, lung, right? Then there can't be any fire flickering. And that has profound implications for your secret practice. If you get to have a teacher in that and you get to practice those things, it is, uh, Master Shantideva is preparing you for Tantra in this statement, in that one line, by saying, don't, so if you think of it as hard work, a pain in the ass, and the effort, you're missing the point and you're missing the creation of those two important things in your spiritual development. You can't possibly get the kaya, the physical kaya and the mental kaya. You can't get the dharma kaya, samboga kaya and the nirmana kaya without effort. And then understanding that in the sutra path gets you to a tantric path, the secret path, and then you will see this same thing in a completely different light. Huh, light. And then um, you've actually built the courses to see it that way through your sutra practice of this. Yeah, so that line and this chapter is vital, is vital for your, your awakening. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to understand the definition of merit, and you mentioned it's the first three. Is that the only definition? Let's just say that's the collection of merit. Mm -hmm. They say the collection of merit is just all your good seeds, all your good virtue, all your goodness, all your positive karmas. Every activity you've done of body, speech, and mind that has a positive charge to it, that has a intent behind it to do a goodness. 
that is your merit. Mm -hmm. That is your affliction. Mm -hmm. And then he said, effort is joy, right? Effort is not working hard, working faster, working stronger, what all the other obligation, all the other things. He said, it's actually joy in doing good. <coughs> Hector, mm -hmm. what's joy? Yeah. Yeah. I tried to get it to you in your meditation, okay? I'll give you an example. If you've um, if you've fallen in love and you've looked at another person, even if it's for three seconds, okay, or if it's for an hour, or if it's the first time you meet them and something is born in your heart that looks upon that other person and says, I could give a shit about what happens to me, but I just want your happiness. Like I, you sort of disappear for a second. Or you watch a child and they're having fun and they don't know you're watching. And you have this smile ha come to you and you're like, that is adorable. And I wanna grow that, I want more of that. Yeah, or if you're at the Bushwick love party on Saturday night, <laughs> on Valentine's night, and you saw 400 people raging, drinking up and dancing and talking to each other and playing with balloons and taking photos and just enjoying themselves. And you knew secretly that all that effort, all that activity was turning into medical clinics for the kids in Nepal. That's joy. When you have that feeling and it and it comes, it just it arises. Yeah? It's this beautiful sensation that isn't concerned about your own personal well being for me protecting it's not grasping like that. It's it's open. I don't know. That's when I think of joy, that's the things I think about, like that. That's how they describe love in Tibet, too. Mm -hmm. The way, which which one in particular out of those three, the Bushwick Love Party for the... No, it's just like, it's not selfish. It's yeah, it's not selfish, it's, yeah, selfless. Okay. So it's about feeling that when you catch yourself doing something good, and we're terrible at it in the West. Mm -hmm. Like, we're horrible at it, because we think it's not cool. We think, you know, we have to be deficient. We think we have to be deficient. We think we are mistaken. We have original sin, or whatever thing we learnt, we think we're a problem. Buddhist practices, no. You might find yourself in problems, but you are not the problem. Like that. You are not... The th you're not the thing you're identifying with. You can. That's a changeable thing. You're a changeable thing. Yeah. Is it also physical though? I, I like. I feel when I think of joy as like a, almost more physical than, and I, I associate mental. it and I associate it with mental. But that's why I, I keep touching here because for me it's an emotion. It comes to your mind, which is at the core of your heart. And in the West we think your mind, right? But this sensation here, this open-heartedness here turns into physical, it turns into a physical sensation. But I, I think primarily it's a mental function. It, it comes from your mind. Joy. Hector, the reason why I ask is because a lot of the times, ever since studying this scripture, mm -hmm. I find myself doing things, but it's almost like I'm forcing myself. So it's difficult to, to feel that joy without yeah. kind of cultivating yeah. it and then it feels it, it might feel false. False. Yeah, yeah. And then that's a problem. Yeah. No. Good. Let me go through this one. Mm -hmm. I love that you have that in your sights though, because that's a very typical problem of getting an Eastern philosophy into the Western context. Right. And particularly in our modern world. I I found a problem as well with self-generating a positive attitude. Mm -hmm. I think somehow it's fake. And fake is a value that is strong in me 
saying you cannot have fake and so I keep labeling my experiences or I, ha I used to label more my experiences as I'm faking it I'm pretending it and so on and really what you're doing psychologically is you're recoloring that experience with that idea the experience is empty too so if you can conjure it without the extra judgment it is valid you every action will have a reaction everything is a cause for something else and if you did a good thing you'll get a good result if you're overthinking you're also going to get overthinking attached to that result if you overthink it with self-doubt you're also going to get the result with self-doubt and overthinking if you do, do you see how it, it works we just think that's the way it is <laughs> and it isn't <laughs> I think it also comes with um, I know this could be a longer debate but things doing things that you love yeah, finding your calm, finding your yeah. bliss, absolutely, absolutely. That's an, a good way to enter. That's a really, really good way to enter. But also facing the darknesses that you need to right, fight, yeah. you need to jump in there to your capacity. There's these words that come up at towards the end of the path when you have uncontrived experiences and I and I used to wonder why do they use that term because I like the term be beautiful to have an uncontrived sense of bodhicitta you know and obviously they use the word because you're contriving it up until then <laughs> like it's not there because the, <laughs> you know like you're like oh that's why they're saying uncontrived because everyone's been contriving it until it becomes uncontrived. You generate a pattern of looking at the world until you actually see the world that way. And you know you created it and it becomes uncontrived. And it's okay. I mean, that's how you got this view in the first place. You think you didn't learn to look at the world the way you're looking at it from because someone else taught you it? You think it just, that's the way it is? Someone taught you to look at the world this way. I can prove it to you by grabbing you here and putting you in another country and they'll see the world in a different way. And you're like, no, you're seeing it wrong. Yeah. And you'll be the only one, you see. So we learn through childhood, through our upbringing, through our schooling, etc., all these prejudices that we all agree are our prejudices and are our truth. And so we are nice and neat in that. And if we go too much out of that, we freak out. Yeah? I think we should have a quick break and then I'll actually start the class. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, after the break. Yeah, after the break. Yeah, cool. Thanks. So let's let's be back at ten past nine at the latest. Yeah, if you can come back early, it'd be great. So I can actually